No Choir Boy. Murder, Violence, and Teenagers on Death Row. Susan Culkin. Chapter 1. I was a teenager on death row. Decatur, Alabama, August 12, 1993. Kevin Gardner was not home, even though it was way past his 11 o'clock curfew. Kevin was a good kid, and it was unusual for him to stay out late without calling to let his parents know where he was. When he didn't show up the next morning, his father called the police. The same night, a police officer had received a dish dispatch to meet some individuals at Cedar Lake. They had discovered a body. It was Kevin's. Before long, the focus of the investigation turned to Kevin's friend, Roy Burgess Jr., like Kevin. He was 16 years old. Roy. The judge said, stand up. I was crying bad. I was so nervous. By the powers vested in me in the state of Alabama, I hereby sentence you to die by electrocute. He couldn't get the word out because I went crying and screaming. In the court, there was a big commotion. My mother, my father, my brothers. They were all screaming. Nine or ten police rushed to the courtroom. They were two big, redneck policemen. One had juice dripping down from his chin from chewing tobacco. They literally carried me to the courthouse through a catwalk, a tunnel, and straight down to the, to the garage and into a squad car. There were a few ladies there, female judges. Their eyes were filled with tears. They tried to control it when I went by. They had their hands over their mouths, but I could see the tears in their eyes. The officer with the chewing tobacco had a huge pistol, like a .357, some long barrel revolver. He said, you done killed one, but I'm going home tonight and I'm going home alive. I was still crying. Then they sent somebody to gather up my property, what little I had. I didn't get to see my family or say goodbye or anything. It's a big mess. A big mess. They put me in belly change and dragged me, still crying, to the squad car. We rode over five hours, maybe seven, to the state prison. They had the red and blue lights on, but no siren. They were going 70, 80. But for the time I came to this prison here in 19... In 96, that was one time I was on the highway after the trial. It was December, around 7 or 8 o'clock, so it was dark when we arrived. Before we even got there, I could see the prison for a mile or two. It was all lit up like a dome, like an aura. There was razor wire all around, and towers. My knees were knocking so bad. I don't see myself as a monster, man. I can be productive. I can carry a job. I got a work permit when I was 15. My first job, I worked at Popeye's. I cooked. The second job I had at Long John Silver's. And the third job I got at a steakhouse. I got something to tell. I'm embarrassed to talk into this tape because I know my grammar ain't so good. I'm into talking about this to you because I don't have many people here to talk. Uh, I don't have many people to talk to here. The other inmates can be hateful. This place can make people hateful. There are some genuine gangsters here. I try to keep that in mind. I was a coward. I still am. I get back to get back to what happened when I went to death row. They searched me and took my measurements for clothes. They found out what I'm allergic to, if anything. They checked to see what I got that I ain't supposed to have. I just had my clothes. Didn't have nothing else with me. Then I was taken to my cell. The cells were in tears like you see in the movies. 12 stairs cells upstairs and 12 downstairs. They took me to cell 5-6. That's tier 5, cell number 6. It was tan, light brown with steel walls. It got bars in the front of the cell. It was really small. It looked like a closet. Roaches everywhere. There was a steel cot with a mattress that they issue. I didn't get a pillow at first. There was a toilet and sink. There, were a sh there was a shelf over the bed for the TV if you got one. Your family would have to buy it. The way I understand it, when a guy didn't have a family or other inmates would try to assist him, or the chaplain would. The thing that tr tripped me out the most was after they had me processed. See, they took me to my cell. At the time, you could have radios. Everybody was playing the blues. Soul music. It creeped me. There were blues all up and down the tears. You know, I come to like it after a while. But back then, it creeped me out so bad. On the street, I listened to Led Zeppelin, Shardy, stuff like that. Everything but bluegrass. This was just the blues. There was a few people there who I'd known from the country jail. They spoke to me when they saw me coming in or heard me come in. Thank God I made it to my cell without crying. 
I hadn't eaten all day. The guard went to the commissary and brought back a bag of cookies. I'm crying all night, crying and eating cookies all night long. That first night, I thought the state was going to kill me right then and there. I'm thinking that I'd be dead in a month. I didn't understand what the appeals process was about. I thought I only had a few weeks. Oh man, I was scared. I had seen a lot of movies about prison, but I had never been to prison. And now here I am not only going to prison for the first time, but I'm going to death row too. Man, Roy's been in prison since he was 16 years old. First, he was in a country jail and then on death row in a state penitentiary. In 2001, his death sentence was reversed and he was shifted from death row to a general maximum security prison. It's only been a few years since he's been off the row. This year is his 10th year locked up, an anniversary that weighs on him. The time I was on death row, I was a kid. Man, I wasn't even able to vote for politicians who opposed the death penalty. I wasn't able to join the military. I wasn't old enough to buy liquor. How do you sentence somebody that young to death? Donaldson Prison. As long as you're alive and breathing, you got a chance. Once they kill you and bury you, it's over. I got hope, but I asked myself, how long is it going to take? 10 years? 20? I'm 26. In 20 years, I'm 46. Phew. Phew. I can't get that back. Can't get that time back. It's a mess. One big mess. I mean, the whole thing happened so fast that you didn't take time to care about it. At least I didn't. I know I did an awful thing. If they change me from life without to just life, the minimum time is seven. Seven years. That's if the family, the gardeners, don't protest. The, this Friday will be August 13th, and I will be off the street 10 years. Man, I ain't seen the moon or the stars in 10 years. I ain't felt grass on my feet in 10 years. Women talk about a biological clock, right? I feel like I have a biological clock. I want a family. I want kids. Man, my whole life, man, I'm done, man. Here's what led up to Roy landing on death row. He was hanging out with a group of guys, uh, Kevin M., Demetrius S., and Richie J., who shared an apartment across the street from Roy's girlfriend's house. They were a few years older than Roy. No one can figure out how these guys paid their rent because none of them worked, because only one of them worked part-time delivering pizza. See, that's what I don't like about this whole mess. Roy leans forward. They weren't that I thought they, they weren't what I thought they was at the time. They was gang members. I got very little respect for gang members. They were older. The one time I hung out with a tough crowd, it got me in trouble. Roy lived with his family in a middle class development. His mother worked in a bank. His father worked for an anti-freeze company. Though he came from a stable home, Roy had his problems. He was in and out of school. I want to tell you about that, Roy says. I was just weak, just coasting through life. Man, I don't even know how to describe myself. I went to school. I was in the 10th grade when I got locked up, getting ready to go to 11th. I had teachers I admired, but I didn't pay them no mind at the time. You know what I'm saying? As far as teachers, man, I had three teachers I wish I can get in touch with now just to let them know they made some type of impact on me. That's another thing. I had conflicts sometimes. I can't resist conflicts. Sometimes I bite my tongue about this. I got in trouble a lot, but it was all kid stuff. It wasn't violent. Firecrackers to school, pranks. I was suspended for certain things. What things? Saying stuff in class. Pause. Because uh, sometimes we all need to grow up. I never got suspended for fighting or things like that. There was just a lot of stuff of self-reaction because I tried to fit in. I was a fair student. B, C's, and occasional A. I like science. Math intimidated me. The more I do math, the more beauty I see in it. I wish I had applied myself more. According to the trial records, Roy had been picked up for petty thefts, but he had no significant prior criminal activities. I was an ass. Roy sips his coke. His thoughts are beyond this room, in some other place. A small space where we are talking is quiet, but for the humming of an air conditioner. On the day of Kevin Gardner's murder, all the guys were hanging out on, at the apartment drinking beer, smoking weed. They got to talking about how they needed some money. One of them said, let's go steal a car or a car stereo or something at the mall. They all hustled over to the mall. While the others went inside, Roy hung around the parking lot talking to someone in a white sporty looking pickup truck. Roy hitched a ride from one end of the parking lot to the other with the driver of the truck. 
Later, at the trial, the man told the court that Roy stopped him outside of the mall, asked for a ride, asked about a speaker system, asked if he had any money, and did he want to buy a gun. The prosecutors used this to suggest that Roy was trying to carjack the truck. It had nothing to do with Kevin Gardner. According to Roy, what he was trying to do was sell the man a broken down pistol. After not coming up with the money at the mall, Roy and his friends went back to their homes. Later in the day, Roy returned to the guy's apartment and asked Richie and Demetrius if they wanted to go to a party at Cedar Lake. Kevin Gardner, a kid in his class, was waiting to drive them in his blue Firebird. Roy introduced everybody and climbed into the front seat. Richie sat in the back behind Kevin. Demetrius sat behind Roy. The stereo was so loud, Richie and Demetrius later said, that they couldn't hear the conversation in the front. The car turned onto an unpaved road in an isolated area. Kevin refused to drive farther. They would have to get out and walk. According to Demetrius, Roy opened the door and then quickly turned and shot Kevin in the head. Oh shit. Richie and Demetrius said they were terrified about what had happened. They were scared and huddled in the back seat. They wouldn't help move the, bo the body. Roy had to do it himself, and then he drove the car back to town. They returned to the apartment to find more guys. When told what had just happened, the new guys later described themselves as shocked and scared. But somehow they all had enough courage to come up with a plan to sell Kevin's car to a chop shop in Birmingham, a little south of Decatur. Roy and Kevin M. drove Kevin's car and the rest in the car of a kid named Hayes. As they caravaned to Birmingham, Roy and Kevin threw out items belonging to Kevin. A set of drums was tossed out on the road. Golf clubs he had borrowed from a friend that were left at a service station. In Birmingham, they couldn't find a chop shop, so they ended up leaving a car in the parking lot of a go-go club, club and returned to Decatur. Demetrius and Richie kept the car speakers. They, Roy went home with some CDs in the CD player. He later sold them to a former neighbor who would testify at the trial. Demetrius also testified against Roy at the trial. He told the jury that he could not stop thinking about the murder. He said that he had trouble sleeping. He described the following day when all three roommates paid a visit to Demetrius' grandmother who lived in the Cedar Lake area. First, they stopped to see if Kevin's body was still there. It was. They called the police and said they found a dead body while they were out picking blackberries. On the witness stand, but for a few minor discrepancies, the other two roommates told similar stories. After the police found Kevin's body, they interviewed the three blackberry pickers. That was not much to go on. No obvious leads. Um, one of the police officers had worked in, narco in the narcotics division and already knew one of the guys. Since he knew where to find him if he needed more information, the police let Demetrius Ritchie and Kevin M. go home. Since they were all together in one apartment while Roy was alone at his family's home, there was plenty of time for the three roommates to come up with a single story. Soon thereafter, the police brought the three guys back to the station house and started to interrogate them. By law, they could be charged with the murder because they were accomplices. There was plenty of evidence that they took part in the planning of the crime and stole Kevin's car stereo. But Kevin M., Demetrius S., and Richie J. were promised complete immunity as long as they were not the ones who pulled the trigger. They fingered Roy for the murder of Kevin Gardner, and in return, they spent not one day in jail. Roy Smiles continues, a very strict family. We lived in a three-bedroom house. My mother and father had a bedroom. Me and Jeremy had a bedroom. Omar and my baby brother Daniel had a third bedroom. You see, I'm the oldest of four boys. We were all born two years apart. We are all close and love each other dearly. They accept my phone calls and write not as much as I'd like. They're cool. I was really hyper as a kid. I took hyperactivity medication into my early teens. I always had to learn the hard way, on everything. I got a problem with discipline. I have a temper. I couldn't take advice from everyone. I thought I was the exception to the rule. I figured that even though people fail when they do something their own way, not the regular way, I'm going to be the one to succeed. I learned it doesn't work that way, not at all. I came from a really strict family. I was raised in Pentecostal in a Pentecostal home. Religion was my mother's idea. My daddy followed her lead. My father is religious, but he ain't weird like my mom. We said prayers at dinner. He went to church every Saturday Sunday morning. I ain't had no choice. My parents forced me to go. Here I am 16 years old, and every Friday night, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, I had to go to church. 
no parties, no movies, no choice. Couldn't even play with a water gun, a BB gun. We couldn't listen to secular music. No dancing. I could have girlfriends, but I couldn't bring nobody to the house. I had one girlfriend in my life. I was 16. She was 14. When I was younger, my mom praised me. Then, when I got older, things changed. She's stubborn, I'm stubborn, and we both want our own it our own way. There was lots of yelling, a lot of punishment. I got... Dim- I got it the worst of all the boys. I would get sent to my room, no TV, no desserts, no phone, stuff like that. I had to stand outside in the cold or the heat. She beat me with brushes, hoses, switches, western boots, shoes. What else, What was going on between me and my mom affected everybody else. My mother went inside my head mostly because of her religion. That's another thing that kind of, that's kind of got me. Most of what I've come to learn about the world was completely opposite from what my parents taught me. They had me believing that the world is fundamentally good and every now and then you run across a bad person. I don't necessarily believe that. I believe that the world is screwed up and the good people are the exception to the rule. It's more rare to find a decent person than it is somebody who's going to try to take something from you. That's probably because I'm in here. When I was younger, I didn't think that way. My girlfriend, Jackie, she was white. She was my only official girlfriend. I met Jackie at a skating rink. My mother never would let me go to no skating rink, no how. I lied, saying I had to go to work. It felt good to lie. It felt like I had beaten her. You know what I'm saying? A lot of guys here, they laugh when I tell them I only had one girlfriend, especially since I was on death row and everything. I had no occasion to date a black woman. I had never slept with a black woman. I wasn't cool. I hadn't done anything. The guys there, they had la- they laughed and said, they're trying to kill you and you didn't even have a chance to do nothing. Arrested. It was 12 or 1 o'clock that night, August 16th, 1993. I remember my baby brother, Daniel. He looked out the window and said somebody was outside. So I peeked out the blinds and saw two, two police cars. I went to the front door and opened the latch a crack. Then I closed it and Dunn took off, took the chain off. I knew that it was I knew what it was about. I had only a pair of shorts on and I wanted to put some clothes on. But my brother opened the door and before I could get dressed, the police came in and said I was under arrest for murder. After they told me that, my mother and father came to the door. My daddy, he got mad. That's the first time I heard my daddy cuss. He said, "Hey, get out of my house. I don't want to say the words he used, but you know what they are, right?" They said, "We're arresting you your son for murder, man." My mother screamed and fainted against the wall. They twisted me out of the house. I was still in my shorts. We were on the street, and there were at least five more police cars. We lived in a predominantly white neighborhood. We usually stayed by ourselves. Everyone was up. Everyone was coming out on the street. They read me no rights. They they did that later at the police station. At the station, I could hear my mother and father screaming they wanted to see me. I don't remember all the things they did when I was arrested. I know they photographed me and everything. They put me in an office in the detective division. I remember my daddy arrived and was yelling out front. I didn't want to see him. But the officer said I should have my daddy present and then I, when I give my testimony. My mom stood by me, but not like my father. He loved me. Me. No matter what. If there is such a thing as unconditional love, a God, he most closely represents that. My whole life, I remember him getting up, going to work, coming home, sitting down to watch the game. Come back home take a, and take a little nap. I mean, that's what he did. My old man didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't run around the streets. My folks are divorced now. I was a contributing factor. After Roy was advised of his rights, the state's, state's brief reports he admitted that he shot Kevin Gardner. He was put in a cell alone. County Jail. It was a requirement that I had attorney. He interviewed me. I guess he had in mind I was guilty from the get-go and it was an open and shut case or whatever. He did just what he had to do to get by and no more. Since it was a capital murder case, there was no plea bargaining. There was no bail. At first I thought I'd just go to juvenile, but they denied that. Jeez. There's a lot of complications involved with what went down, who was telling the truth and who was lying. Those guys, my friends, they weren't what they seem. I mean, so many lies being told, so many thoughts being put out. The other guys never spent a day in jail. I was tried as an adult. 
I learned a lot over the years. I'm still learning. During the time before trial, I stayed by myself in the jail. I, I was treated good. I had to run. I had the run of that jail because I was absolutely the youngest person there. If I had seizures, sometimes I had these seizures. See, it's no big deal. I went to the hospital with no handcuffs, no nothing. I took courses with everybody else. I took the tests and passed. 75% don't. I do a lot of reading. It's a way to try to stay sane. Now I read classical literature. Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained. I read The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri. Some poems, some Shakespeare. Man, I listen to National Public Radio a lot. They had this show on last week from a prison. They were, st uh, they were staging Act 5 of Hamlet. They made me want to read that play so much. The guys acting in the play were actually convicted murderers. There is a lot of symbolism in that. I seen Mel Gibson's Hat Hamlet. This is what I do now. Let me go back to then. The sheriff, he died a few months ago, did the best thing anyone ever did for me. When I passed my GED, he let me go to the graduation ceremony, cap and gown, suit and tie, no handcuffs, no shackles. He got my mom to buy two long stem roses, one for my teacher and one for my girlfriend. I was in the free world with regular people. He made the guards wear suits and ties like everyone else. That was the coolest thing anyone did for me in my life. The sh that sheriff, he caught hell doing what he did for me. Why you let that murderer out? Oh, he caught hell. Later, I wrote him. I wrote him right before I got off death row. I told him that was the single most important thing anyone's ever done for me. I appreciated him. I didn't expect him to do it. I said, I appreciate everything you did. Even though I be on death row, I'll do whatever I can to better myself. And if you can't write back, I will understand. While Roy takes another break, here's more about his trial. The trial. The state's brief, brief described the time when Roy took the stand on his behalf. He admitted he was present when Kevin was killed but denied shooting him. He claims that Demetrius shot Kevin from his position in the back seat on the right side of the car. He said he tried to warn Kevin that Demetrius and Rich, Richie intended to rob him. But Kevin Gardner, according to Roy, expressed no concern, no fear at all. Roy said he reluctantly took part in the trip to Birmingham and that the others made fun of him because he was crying. He, made, he admitted to taking the CD player and some CDs from the victim's car. He also admitted to owning a gun, but the gun didn't work, so he sold it to someone he knew at church, at church the following Sunday, the Sunday following the murder. Roy in a cap and gown. What, can, what, what about confession back when he arrested? Roy told the court that he lied about shooting Garter so they would leave me alone. He said he felt the, he felt that the police had already made up their minds that he pulled the trigger. He said he thought a confession was the best thing he could do to make it easy on himself. Kevin M., one of the three roommates living in the apartment, testified that he heard one of the other two boys say, Man, you can't, you can't just take the car from him. You've got to tie him up or kill him or something. But they had full immunity and were not tried as accomplices. The defense attorney put a young woman on the stand. She said she heard Demetrius and her sister arguing about something. She heard her sister say to Demetrius, I know you are the one that shot Kevin. And then she heard Demetrius reply, yeah, I am the one that shot him, but you see who's taking the blame and you see who is walking free. The sister testified immediately afterwards. She backed up the previous testimony that Demetrius had in fact admitted he was the one who had shot Gardner and that Burkus was taking the blame. The defense then put up a third witness, Craig Turner, who testified that Demetrius had twice implied that they got the wrong guy. No matter. Based on the testimony of the three roommates who had immunity, the jury found Roy guilty of capital murder. Roy is ready to talk more. Between my trial and the sentencing was 30 days. Besides my graduation, I had never left the municipal prison. At the sentencing, my mother, my father, and a lady who goes to our church all talked for me. My little brother was on the stand and spoke on my behalf. That brother of mine, he stood up in that courtroom and begged for my life. A little kid. I would say he was about 10 then, but the judge knew that he was going to slaughter me anyway. The jury came back 10 against 2 in favor of life without parole. The judge overruled it and sentenced me to death. I couldn't believe it. They had a conviction and a jury recommendation. 10, out of, 10 people out of 12 said I should get life without parole. Two people said I should be executed. I'm thinking they're going to give me life without, right? 
Kevin's family was there. I want to talk to them. I, I want to, I just saw them that one time at the trial. Even they said I got a raw deal. I wanted to tell them, Phew, hold on a minute, hold on. If I, if I saw them again, I'd, I'd get on my knees and beg for forgiveness. Roy leans back in his chair, way back. 20 seconds, 30, 45. I mean, 10 to 2. I'm not mad at the judge. It gave me a chance to do a little growing before they threw me to the lions here in this place. Man, 